Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast, brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights and expression. Welcome back to So to Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I am, as always, your host, Nico Perino. And my conversation today is with Lulu Chang Mazurvi. She is Vice President of Communications for the popular publishing newsletter service Substack, and she is also a board member of the video game juggernaut Activision Blizzard. Lulu, welcome onto the show. Thank you, Nico. Thanks for having me. So I've been eager to have you on the show, I think it since January, when you had a tweet go viral about how Substack approaches moderation decisions and why it supports free speech principles. Uh, it's gone more viral than any tweet that I've ever put out, or I think uh, <laughs> Fire has ever put out, something like 30,000 likes, 4,000 retweets, over a thousand quote tweets. You always like to see that sort of thing happen, right? Especially your bosses. <laughs> Warning. Yeah, you're taking me back to a very bizarre time in my life. And by the way, I was on maternity leave. The reason that it's taken us so long to get together is that I was on mat leave until late March. So this happened at a time when I was already sort of delirious and uh, had a shaky grasp of reality. So it was very surreal. And when those sorts of things happen, you, you, it's hard to pull yourself from the phone, right? To just see what people are saying about you and what's, what's saying about what you've said and saying about the company that you work for and hoping you didn't screw anything up for your bosses. I know what that's like. I also know what it's like to be on leave because I have an 11 month old, but mm-hmm. and congratulations about that, by the way. Thank you. Before we, before we dive into that though, Lulu, um, there are probably some of our listeners who aren't familiar with Substack. Um, so let's start there. Can you describe what Substack is for those of us who might not be familiar with it? Yeah, it's a platform for independent publishing. So if you want to publish independently, whether that's a newsletter or a podcast or video, you can do that on Substack. And what it gives you is you have your website plus your newsletter plus um, your direct connection with the audience, by which I mean nothing gets between you and the people that you're publishing to. You own your list. You get to decide what you want to write and say, which is sometimes contentious. And we support you through things like workshops, services, and advice. Now, is this sort of service new? I mean, what was Substack's thinking when it came into this this space, right? Substack started fittingly with a blog post. Um, uh, we have three co-founders, Chris Best, Hamish McKenzie, and Jera Sethi. And uh, Chris tells it as basically he started a company to procrastinate on this blog post. And the blog post <laughs> is really about why the information ecosystem is broken and specifically about how social media is breaking people's brains. Um, I don't think I've even seen a complete version because he truly never finished the blog post. He'd started Substack instead as an answer. Basically, he took this idea to Hamish, which is saying that social media is breaking how we think. And I I think Hamish told him, well, what are you going to do about it? You don't really have a solution. The solution then became Substack, which was fixing the ills of uh, a lot of what we see with social media. It incentivizes the wrong kind of behavior. It incentivizes not quality content. And it makes us as Chris says, angrier and dumber. And so Substack was created to to build the right incentives into the system where the better quality things rise to the top, where you have the freedom to work on what you want and where people are rewarded as they deserve. So a lot of journalists you see coming onto Substack and starting essentially a media business where they get paid a lot more because that's what the market has determined that their work is worth. Yeah. So it's, when I, so it's, Different than what existed prior to it in perhaps two ways, right? Because blogs have always existed, right? But the sort of platform where you can pair the blog with a subscription service and a newsletter service is the niche that I think Substack has carved out for itself. Correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah. also the ethos that you just discussed behind Substack and publishing and writers and content creators getting their message out there. Yeah, I would rephrase that a little bit. I think you hit on it with the two things. One of the things is the actual product. Yeah, it combines the blog with the newsletter and the mailing list with these new features and tools and a way to connect your audience with the seamless payment system. Um, that's useful. But the second thing is it introduced a new 
you called it ethos. It's a new pattern of behavior. It's a new set of incentives where we've made it normal to pay for work that's really good. In the early days of the internet, there was this belief that everything should just be free. And in the early days of blogging or the golden days of blogging, which we yearn for, there was still a belief that these were just things that were free. Um, now we are pushing in the direction of paying these writers what they deserve. And so part of the innovation of Substack is not just the actual technology, actually primarily not the technology. It's primarily the norm of paying people for great writing. I hadn't even really thought about that. So I went to journalism school in the mid 2000s. Um, and at that point, we, people just expected news to be free as if there was no sort of Okay. cost to producing it, right? But we also expected to pay for other things that people created, like music. Well, we can put the Napster whole fiasco uh, to the side, but to a certain extent, music, movies, books, right? And so there were a lot of discussions when I was in journalism school around what did journalists and publishers do wrong in the 90s in particular with the rise of the internet. And it was to base journalism on the historical advertising model. Right. Um, putting aside the subscription model that was often paired with that uh, to make the internet you know, more accessible and the content more accessible on the internet. But you had, you had a collective action problem to a certain extent, right? If one company didn't have a paywall, it would get a competitive advantage because it would get greater traffic. Um, and with it, more readers, more advertising re revenue, so on and so forth. So that's what most companies did is they, they didn't have the paywall. And then you have the problem where advertising revenue is declining. The reading base has been conditioned to not pay for content. And so now pu publishers are in a different, difficult position of deciding whether to move behind a paywall, lose the readers, while their competitors perhaps don't go behind a paywall. So I hadn't thought of Substack as kind of addressing that historical problem, but readers are starting to get accustomed and perhaps due in part to the efforts of Substack to paying for quality content, content that they, they really enjoy. And you're seeing other publications move behind uh, a paywall, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. And also, since you guys have um, started, what, what year were you founded? 2017. Yeah, now you're seeing some of these publications also move to the newsletter model, which yeah. any of uh, any of us who, like New York Times, for example, they've got John McWhorter and other people, and John McWhorter's on our board, so that's why I use his name, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as as newsletter writers for them, recognizing also anyone who works in the communication space like we do, that an email address is like the golden ticket. It's the gold standard, right? If you have that, it's still the best way after all these years to get get in touch with people. So I know that was a long monologue on my part, but I hadn't even thought of sub Substack as kind of changing or attempting to change the expectations of readers for what what how the, how they can consume content, what they should expect to pay for. So that's the disruption. Um, we are a tech company technically, but it's not. Um, for us, it's not that we're creating the ca the shiny new widget or the the trendy tech of the day. We're not making like AI in the metaverse or whatever. It, it's pretty, uh, you know, it's pretty simple, elegant technology. It's well built, but the real disruption is in these patterns of behavior and in norms. And yes, great writing is absolutely worth paying for. In fact, what's more worth paying for? Like great writing shapes societies. It shapes how people think. It creates the rise and fall of entire social phenomena. What could be more important? And so why have we gone so long without assigning real monetary value to this? And the people who are helping us shape that culture and creating uh, you're creating these new ideas that they're putting out into the world, why should they not get richly rewarded for that? That's an incredibly important thing they're doing. Do you think it's the fact that you're so focused on independent writers who have an independent audience base separate from any pet publication that they might be affiliated with that makes you successful, right? You can pick up the New York Times and read the entire paper without re really ever looking at the byline or caring uh, about the byline. It's the sort of publication you sort of expect a standard of journalism that's produced from it. Um, but there's no, aside from your connection with the publication, because you read it every day, there's no sort of relationship developed between you and in particular straight 
news reporters. So is that what makes Substack more compelling and people more inclined to support it? You know, I recall, for example, when Andrew Sullivan went over to Substack from New York Magazine, and I had been a reader of him for a long time. There's speculation that Obama was one of his big readers uh, as well. Um, so I subscribed to Substack when it came because I had always enjoyed reading his piece in New York Magazine. But I, I just wonder whether it's the specific individual that's driving that rather than just a love, for example, of Substack. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it is It is driven by the individual. So I think there's three things happening. One is that the writer comes first. The writer is their own brand. Even small things like if you joined, which I hope you do, it'll be Nico Perino dot substack.com or nicoprino.com like you get your own custom domain or you lead with your name instead of ours that's symbolic of the entire way we operate it's um the writer's in control the writer comes first same with moderation by the way the writer gets to make the first set of decisions on what they want to say um so the writer's brand is way above ours you know i'm the head of comms for substack but my primary priority is being a publicist for writers and oh interesting for- for the people writing and creating on Substack, you know, I I put elevating them and helping to promote their work above elevating the company and even our founders. So that's one thing is the writer does come first. The second thing is um, because Substack lets you thrive and make money and do your best work doing whatever you most believe in, it doesn't correlate as much with the current thing or the trendy thing that everybody's talking about. So a lot of times, if everybody is uh, writing the same thing and you can find that in 500 different places, Substack might be the place where you find that plus different perspectives. And that can be helpful just from the point of view of sheer market dynamics of supply and demand. And then third, um, Substack actually can coexist with your byline on other publications. So Casey Newton, who's one of the top Substackers, still has done podcasting with the New York Times, still has written for The Verge. There's no issue on our end with being part of your writing and creating stack um, because you own all of your IP on Substack. Uh, that means you can go and put it somewhere else. If you publish a book on Substack, you can go publish it somewhere else. We don't care. If you turn your writing into a show or a book or a movie, all of the proceeds are yours. So it actually can coexist with what you're doing elsewhere. Two questions for you, um, sort of challenges I have with the broader business model, subscription-based business model, and a more specific functional question. Uh, the first question is, has Substack ever explored uh, the idea of bundling subscriptions? You see this kind of with uh, Apple News, for example, right now. The challenge being, of course, you have so many different people you like to read. Like I like to read Peter Suderman, who is a Substacker, about how to make cocktails. But I also like to read Andrew Sullivan, and I also like uh, to listen to The Fifth Column, which is also a, a, a Substack. Uh, Camille Foster, the host, is on our board. Um and you have this problem with streaming to a certain extent that they haven't solved. It's like, I I've, I don't even know how much I pay for different streaming services right now because it's so many different ones. But that that's sort of a publication-based model, right? You're paying for the publication then and getting some of that. Um, and then the second question I have is just on the podcast front, and I know a lot of your substackers also produce podcasts, such as The Fifth Column. Putting those behind a paywall has always been challenging for me from like a functional standpoint because I like to use the Apple Podcast app. Um, And so it just becomes, there's just like more complexity to getting that content, particularly audio content in my feed that I have on the podcast app. So just addressing those two challenges that I have in particular when I think of subscription-based services and paywalls. Yeah. Well, the first one is a a fantastic problem to have. (laughs) Like I'm paying too much for Substack's help. Um, It's a wonderful problem to have. We have seen that someone who is subscribing to a Substack is much more likely to subscribe to multiple Substacks. And that's actually part of the network effect. It's like if you're a writer and you publish here, you're more likely to benefit from other people who are reading on Substack. Um, I don't have an announcement today about bundling. It is something that we've looked at. There's a couple of considerations, um, the foremost of which might be that we are If we ever do this, it would only be in a way that maintains that direct connection between readers and writers, where everybody is opting into that relationship and everybody who has it 
owns that relationship and the writer owns their mailing list still. What we wouldn't want is a situation where I opt into this bundle and I become a, a customer of Substack instead of subscriber of yours. And our promise that you get to take your mailing list anywhere starts to get more shaky because now if you take it somewhere, I might say, well, hold on, I was subscribing to Substack, not to Nico. Um, that's that's an oversimplified version, but that's one of the things that we would be very careful of because we've made that promise to writers. Uh, that said, there are these Substack super readers that subscribe to like 118 Substacks or wow. 57 Substacks. I mean, there are You got to give them a badge or something. <laughs> we should, you know, we should buy them a car actually. But um, <laughs> there, are, there are these there are these super readers and I, I would be fascinated. I hope I get to meet them in real life and have a drink with them. But that's that's to your first question is uh, that's the consideration and that, that there are these super readers that probably would be very happy for a bundle. The second one on podcasting, there are different ways to make paying for your Substack worth it. One is to put stuff behind a paywall. Um, but we actually advise people to put their best stuff in front of the paywall, um, make your best stuff free. It, it's just a strategy that we've seen work pretty well. With podcasting, the things that you can offer besides paywall and content are community, which is the same with any other Substack. A lot of a lot of publishers will say, if you pay, then you get to be an extra special member of the community. You get to be on Zoom calls with me. You get to chime in on the common threads and I'll respond to you and you get to join the conversation. You get to suggest things to me. And that has value to people who are, especially who are fans of the writer or the podcaster. Um, also, sometimes you can put a time delay. So you are releasing this post, including an audio post or a podcast post at five o'clock today for your subscribers, but at noon tomorrow for everybody else. And it still feels seamless for people on the other end, but people who are not subscribed could have a delay if you want them to. There's been some criticism of Substack because you get a lot of- very... <laughs> Yeah, like I read that New York Times article. <laughs> um, but uh, the idea that popular journalists are fleeing to Substack where they don't have any editors, right? It's kind of, they can write as much as they want, as long as they want without any checks and balances. Uh, now, I know this isn't quite the case and can be overstated. Like I know there are people who do hire popular sub stackers who make a good amount of money uh, through their subscriptions, like Matt Taibbi, who do have editors or hire editors to help them with their content. Matt's um, someone who I've spoken with quite a bit. Uh, um, and, but that's one of the criticisms, right? It's journalism without without limits. How do you all respond and think through that challenge? In general, writing without limits doesn't sound like a bad thing to me. In general, getting rid of gatekeepers doesn't sound as alarming to me as it might to other people. However, I will say that yeah, it's but not, editors, I mean, but editors do serve a role in the the journalistic. Editors process. are valuable, yeah. So I would say um, it's not. True. I love to. I love to be edited. For example, editors often make my thoughts more compelling or point yeah. out things that I've missed. Yeah, well, I'm hoping that you'll edit this entire thing to make. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also advocate for editors. So I will say it's it's not true, as you've noted, that there aren't editors working with Substackers, and it's not true that it's all journalists either. So on the first score. Um, a lot of success, successful Substackers will hire editors. A lot of people have grown their Substack to a legitimate media business where they've created multiple jobs and have a staff. And that staff often includes editors. Um, for many writers, we have provided access to editors. They get to choose their editor. They get to be the boss of their editor as opposed to the, the other way around. But we have subsidized it. We have made introductions. And so we're pro-editor for anybody who wants it. Um, the difference is that you get to choose if and how you want to be edited. And then the second thing is um, it's it's not all journalists, like I mentioned. You know, some of the top substackers are previous journalists who decided to bet on themselves and come here. But a lot of them are also people like Patti Smith, who releases music and poetry, um, George Saunders, who does writing, you know, literature writing classes, and Chuck Palahniuk does the same thing. Salman Rushdie, who came here because he has so many wild and crazy ideas that don't fit into a traditional book publishing format that he doesn't want to just stifle. He wants to put them out into the world and with a substack he can. And so some of them have editing and some don't. 
um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who wants to use it as a platform to comment on politics and culture. Um, but it's it's in all different categories, not just journalism. Yeah. Well, let's talk. turn now to the aforementioned viral tweet. I'm going to read through a little bit of what you say. Um, this might take me a second, but I think it's important for our listeners. And I'll also link to the tweet in the show notes. Um, and then I want to ask what inspired it all, right? Um, so you write, this is from January 26th, that Substack, we don't make moderation decisions based on public pressure or PR considerations. An important principle for us is defending free expression, even for stuff we personally dislike or disagree with. We understand principles come at a cost. You continue, we want a thriving ecosystem full of fresh and diverse ideas that can't happen without the freedom to experiment or even to be wrong. People already mistrust institutions, media, and each other. Knowing that dissenting views are being suppressed makes that mistrust worse. We made a promise to writers that this is a place where they can pursue what they find meaningful without coddling or controlling. This goes to what we discussed earlier in our conversation um, about not going in between the writer and their audience. Um, you also say, who should be the arbiter, or ask, I should say, who should be the arbiter of what's true and good and right? People should be allowed to decide for themselves, not have a tech executive decide for them. The only area where humans have a perfect track record is that we've consistently gotten things wrong. Every generation has beliefs and blind spots that make future generations aghast. It would be the height of arrogance to think we suddenly become infallible. Now, so as I said, this um, got a lot of attention. So what inspired it? Well, you know, I'm the head of comms and comms people often get measured by not making people angry. And so I had to overcome that. There's a bias in my industry towards not inviting controversy and not upsetting anybody. And um, with this, I felt like these things were just so clearly uncontroversially true that they should be said and they needed to be said because somehow looking around the principle that people should be able to express ideas freely and debate them. And that's actually better for society and better for minority voices uh, has come into question and did become controversial. So I, I, I just felt, um, you know, I, I felt like I should say something. It, this wasn't just me, by the way, this was Substack's founders wrote, wrote a very thoughtful blog post. Yeah, about I've got it printed out here. Yeah. So, so, my thread was really a topper for their for their post, um, and what inspired them to to write at that time, big picture, was that there was a lot of angst around your your taking away gatekeepers and you're letting people say what they want, and and why are you not being more active in censoring? And so there are lots of reasons and good reasons that we're not more active in censoring, and all of that gets gets to it. But it it just struck me, you know, it's. 160 something years since John Stuart Mill wrote the time, hopefully I'm going to paraphrase badly, but hopefully the time has long gone since we had to question why freedom of expression is important for maintaining our society uh, and fighting, uh, fighting dictatorships, something along those lines. And that was, you know, a long time ago and the time has not gone. The time is either still here or has come back. So it, it felt like it needed to be said. I didn't know it would go viral. I was not much of a Twitter person. Now I'm try to be active occasionally in my role as a spokesperson. But, you know, I, I have this sleepy little Twitter account um, where uh, every once in a while I would post. And this thing, I think, got a lot of attention because it hit a nerve. And uh, I think that's because the debate is so unresolved and so heated right now on what we should do about bad content on the Internet and what's the right approach. You know, I think that's exactly right, especially because Substack seems to be taking a divergent approach, at least publicly and within its content guidelines, which we'll discuss here in a second, from a lot of other tech companies. And this speaks to something else that I, I think you touched on, uh, which is the idea that spokespeople, uh, tech executives are often trying to please everyone and as a result, not pleasing anyone. Like I remember around the 2016 uh, election and in, in the years afterwards, especially surrounding the Ru Russian disinformation allegations and Facebook's potential role in, within that, you had uh, 
Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook trying to take on that while at the same time trying to appeal to free speech people. He gave a big speech at Georgetown University that I was invited to but did not attend uh, about the role of free speech within Facebook. But then um, we, you know, it, Facebook stopped talking about free speech um, and a lot of its policies diverged from that sort of um, – so the sort of things that Zuckerberg was talking about in that in that speech. So I think I think the nerve you hit here is that this is a big tech company for all intents and purposes uh, that people are familiar with taking a divergent view and issuing a full throated defense of freedom of expression, um, which, which is new. And if you look at your guys's content guidelines, which I, which I did, um, it, it's you know they're they're not like what you would see. Crazy. At no, they're, they're not that crazy. And actually they seem to be guided by, um, first amendment principles, like, um, got to respect intellectual property. Uh, you cannot incite violence. You cannot issue credible threats of physical harm. Um, you say Substack does not allow harassment or threats. You know, a lot of those things, sometimes harassment codes in college and university campuses are often abused to go after what, many of us would assume would be protected speech, but because they put the words harassment around the code, people are like, oh yeah, okay, these codes are good. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of the um, proof is in the pudding with, with harassment, but also things like don't dox, don't plagiarize, don't impersonate. Um, they seem pretty straightforward. I didn't look at this as a free speech advocate and say, these are crazy. These, these are ripe for abuse and ripe for censorship. Yeah. Well, we also take a position that when we say don't incite violence, for example, that words themselves are not violence, that words are different from violence. So I think you're you're right that how you interpret some of those basic definitions uh, is important because the interpretations have come into question. It shouldn't be that divergent, frankly. Um, part of what we hope to see more of on the internet is just building better systems of incentives instead of more and more whack-a-mole censorship. Because then I think of censorship a little bit like when you're, if you're giving your kid a haircut and you cut a little bit too much on one side, you have to cut more on the other side and you have to cut more on the one side and you end up basically with no hair. And you, you see platforms doing this where they censor this thing and the other people get mad. So then they censor stuff on the other side too and the other people get mad. So their only tool being censorship, they just censor their way into into a corner, basically, instead of addressing the fundamental problem of you're giving the wrong incentives. You reward people for saying viral sensational things, and then you actively push that out and make it viral. And your algorithm pushes that into people's uh, eyeballs without them having asked for it. And that's a just that's always going to lead to people gaming the system by creating shorter, quicker hits of more emotional content because that's what they get rewarded for. Whereas with longer form things that you have to actually subscribe to in order to receive in your feed or in your inbox, Chris says this, uh, people will, he says people will hate read things, but they're not going to hate pay for things. And so it <laughs> creates a different uh, system of incentives that rewards better content. Well, it's, it's funny you say that because there have been some, any journalist knows this and any uh, social scientist knows this, that there's like an inverse relationship between how outlandish a claim is and how much, uh, well, I, I, direct relation at ship, I should say how much attention it gets. Like the more outlandish an op-ed you write or the more outlandish claim, the more attention it's going to get because people are hate reading it, or it's not what you would expect to read, um, which creates all the wrong incentives when your um, incentives are page views. But yes, I mean, you force people to pay for those things. People are going to be less likely to hate read them. But I will say one of the things that particularly stuck out was the, your, you know, your statement that the only thing where the only area where humans have a perfect track record is that we've consistently gotten things wrong. And I think, and, th and, and uh, your co-founders, talked about this as well in their article on Substack. Society has a trust problem. More censorship will only make it worse. We've all lived through the past two years, right? When we were advised not to mask, then to mask, where we had tech companies taking down claims that uh, COVID leaked from a lab. And then you have the federal government a year later actually investigating those cr claims as, as credible, uh, where you have uh, outlets such as NPR or uh, refusing to report on Hunter Biden's laptop saying it's just, this is 
essentially fake news. And then they all, including the New York Times, had to walk it back and say, no, there, this is actually true. After they had taken down the New York Post's Twitter account for doing that reporting, uh, we all lived through the Afghanistan crisis, right, where you have institutions that we presumably trust be completely and utterly wrong about how long it would take the Taliban to take over Kabul. Um, the list just goes on and on and on. And that's the big point that your co-founders are making is that we have a trust problem in, uh, within institutions, like including the federal government, right? It's like, I can't trust the federal government to get me a passport on time. I can't trust <laughs> it to clear the roads. Anyone who tried to drive up I-95 a couple of months ago, including, uh, Tim Kaine, our, our, our state senator here in Virginia, um, you know, and we can't even trust him to give free money away during COVID. So it's like we have a trust problem. And part of that your co-authors or your co-founders make is that because there is censorship, because we see these institutions acting as sorts of ministries of truth, right, and censoring or taking down posts from dissenting or divergent uh, people, some of those posts, which eventually become the truth, right? We're talking about Hunter Biden laptop story. Um, we just don't trust anyone. Um, yeah. And this goes back to the John Stuart Mill point you were making before he had a quote, and I forget it exactly was like, we shouldn't assume that our certainty is the same thing as absolute certainty. Um, yeah. There should, needs to be some intellectual humility. Um, if you feel like you have access to all the information and everyone can speak freely, the information that rises to the top is more likely to be trusted. Um, because it 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 won out in what John Stuart Mill calls a free and open encounter. Um, so yeah. that's my long monologue on trust and truth. Because again, we've all lived through the past two years where there's been a crisis of that. Yeah, there's probably been a crisis of that for longer. I mean, who doesn't remember the Iraq has WMDs? Yeah, right. And this is and this is pretty universal, by the way. Our co-founders, um, Chris Hamish and Jiraj, they are. Uh, a combination of American, Canadian, New Zealander, and Jaraj might even be Japanese, or he grew up in in Japan. This is a this is a very global perspective, and people come from all across the political spectrum. This is not for an American from the West Coast who has a certain point of view. Um, this is anyone anywhere would would want different perspectives represented and should want things that they personally disagree with represented. I mean, who wants tech executives or the government to decide on their behalf what they should believe and what they should enjoy? And there's no issue that I can think of where companies and governments have always gotten it right. I mean, even saying that out loud sounds like a punchline. And to your point about um, trust, or I guess to our founder's point too, about trust coming from knowing that you were shown all the information and had a chance to question it and that other people had a chance to poke holes in it. It's like if your spouse says, by the way, don't look at my phone. There's nothing in there, but just make sure you don't look because you don't need to see that. Is that going to make you trust them more or less? Or in places, in a North Korea-esque place where the government decides this is the one narrative that you're allowed to see, is that going to make you trust that more or less? And so I just don't think it's even credible to make the case that having some centralized person or power decide on your behalf that this is the ultimate truth, especially when it comes to things that we don't understand well yet. Um, it just doesn't seem like it's going to make people believe the information more than they would otherwise if they had a chance to question it. Yeah, the Substack co-founders, they write, the more that powerful institutions attempt to control what can and cannot be said in public, the more people there will be, uh, the more people there will be who are ready to create alternative narratives about what's true, spurred by a belief that there's a conspiracy to suppress important information. They write that we are living through an epidemic of mistrust, particularly here in the United States. Trust in social media and traditional media is at an all-time low. Trust in the U.S. federal government to handle problems is at a near record low. And trust in U.S. major institutions is within two percentage points of the all-time low. They also write that declining trust is both a cause and effect of polarization. To remain in favor with your in-group, you must defend your side, even if that means being selectively honest or hyperbolic, and even if it means favoring conspiratorial, conspiratorial narratives over the pursuit of truth. So their point about polarization is also one 
that's well taken and it's something that we have all seen kind of us retreat into our echo chambers um, and they argue that that has something to do with declining trust in our institutions which has something to do perhaps with censorship and a limiting of free expression yeah well also big powerful institutions have always favored the majority and the mainstream and the established and so the the implication is that if you are a minority, if you're someone who has had less power historically or has had less of a voice, this is better for you. You don't have to wait for the government that has probably not treated you so well in the past or not acknowledged you so well in the past to come around and to help you out. You now have your own voice and you can build your own, in this case, media property. Well, there is there is the question, and this is a, a, a critique or kind of a pushback that's often get is these are private companies, right? So you guys can set up whatever parameters you want based on whatever values you have. And some of these communities um, draw bounds around that so that they do create a sense of community, right? And so, for example, on a lot of these platforms, you can't have pornography because that's not seen to be supportive of whatever your community standards are. Or, you know, there are other boundaries. I remember the early days of the internet when I was on uh, MySpace, for example, you could do things like tweak the HTML <laughs> on your page, which created this kind of sort of wild west feel, uh, uh, feel that and to a certain sense if, would drive people away. Level, I would have loved to see your page. <laughs> well, I was in a, I used to be in a death metal band back in my younger days. And so we had a MySpace account, which is where music, people posted music, especially for Amazing. bands at that time and pure volume that I don't think is around anymore, but we had a, anyway, long story short, like there are certain things around the edges to police a community that just make the community a little bit more functional. And I think it becomes ever more uh, necessary at the smaller the community gets, right? Uh, like you'll, be, there are community Facebook groups, for example, that have rules that the broader Facebook doesn't have. So how, how do we, how should we think about those uh, creating a sense of community? Yeah. Or is, and, and, and I, you can draw parallels with colleges and universities, right? Like college and universities, they, a lot of them have statements says we're the host of critics, but we're not the critics ourselves. So we sent, we set up these broad, um, guardrails, but individual student groups, for example, like the Christian evangelical group on campus or the Democratic um, and Republican groups on campus, they can set up different guardrails to protect their free association rights. So it's like creating this like this community of different associations bounded by the infrastructure created by the larger institution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we think of it almost like a city with different neighborhoods. I've heard Chris describe it that way. But um, it's, I, I said earlier, uh, in this podcast that everything is writer led and reader led, that writers and readers are in control. They get to decide what they write, what they subscribe to. And one of those things is primarily how they moderate. Um, there are these basic guardrails on Substack as a whole, like you noted, but where this really comes into play is writers get to decide and podcasters get to decide what they want their community to be. And that can really be anything. They can moderate people for any reason. They can block people. They can ban people for, for anything, re regardless of what our platform rules are. Um, Freddie DeBoer has done this where he, he said in the past, I'm fed up with you guys for a while. I'm banning all of you. <laughs> He's done that. You know, I, that's I very him, much Freddie. Freddie's been on the podcast before a long time. I told ago. you not to do this thing. I told you to be respectful. I'm seeing a lot of stuff that isn't that. So all of you are in timeout. He can do that. Like, can you imagine how insane that would be if Substack as a platform did that? Where we're fed up with all of you. Nobody gets to comment for the next month. No, but for individual writers, they're sovereign. They get to do whatever they want. I've only got, I think, 10 minutes left with you, and I want to be respectful of your time. One challenge to this model, of course, is the sort of censorship or deplatforming or demonetizing of uh, different writers and content creators. Um, so, for example, you're probably familiar with this, Colin Wright, because he has a substack uh, yeah. called <laughs> called the uh, Reality's Last Stand. Yeah. He was, because he has a certain perspective on biological sex, um, he was taken off PayPal and Etsy uh, and, and Etsy, right? Um, <laughs> and in his, he's an editor for Quillette. He's a bio, uh, evolutionary biologist. 
uh, he, he actually addresses this in his Quillette post. He says, Substack has great content guidelines, and Stripe, which supports your subscription service, has content guidelines that more or less mirror your guises. Um, I took a look at them before this. They've got a lot, especially relating to specific restrictions in specific countries that have specific laws. But um, there's a broader concern within the free speech community. So a platform like, like um, Substack might have great policies, but the infrastructure of the internet or the infrastructure of commerce in the United States might not have great policies. And as a result, content creators can't make money. They can't distribute their products, such as on Etsy. They can't distribute their content. We saw this happen with Patreon a couple of years ago, which led to a lot of people fleeing that platform, including Sam Harris. Uh, and you have, you have certain writers like Charles Cook over at National Reviewer who talk about Maybe there needs to be a standard for the internet or standard for commerce or maybe even government involvement. I don't know that he would go that far and sort of determine what are general service providers and what are providers that might have an editorial or uh, publisher message that should be free to determine for themselves. So I'm wondering how you guys think about it and how you ensure that your writers can have this freedom when some of your business model, particularly your partnership with Stripe, is based on them also supporting your guys' approach. Yeah, you're certainly right about the, the this rise um, of centralized control all over the internet. And a lot of the big creators and writers that have come over from Patreon cited that as one of the reasons. You know, they'll say they love our product and there's all these other things they can do with it and the quality is smoother, yay. But, but they also cite that here they're not worried about being randomly taken off and having all of their IP erased. Um, so uh, a couple of different things. One is we're not in a position to go and you know, ensure that people have access to their banking system. And, and you're not going to become a banking company is what you're saying? <laughs> no immediate plans to pivot to be a personal um, banking company. So so you're right. There's a lot that is outside of our control. There's a lot that sort of broader problems in society and on, on the internet. Um, not just this, but writ large. However, one of the things that we are doing is pushing for norms, as I mentioned earlier, and pushing for um, pushing for different ways of looking at things, different incentive systems. And one of the norms that we are pushing for is to allow many different points of view and to allow people to decide for themselves. And we hope that that will spread outwards, not just through blogging, but more broadly, Two, the thing that we can do is give our writers a lot of support and different options. When people feel that they have any kind of problem with payments or support or the technology, anything at all, they hit us up directly. We fix it for them. Some people text our founders. Some people text our product guys. Some people just write into support. Our support team is is really amazing and um, probably over service compared to other support teams, you know, the, their rate of clearing tickets within 24 hours is really incredible. So there's that. And then there's giving people other options. We have Bitcoin payments um, available for writers that want it, if they want a different way to get paid. Um, and all of that put together gives people a lot more options, not infinite options, but a lot more than they otherwise would have. So you have writers like Nikita Petrov, who is incredible. He writes Psychopolitica, uh, uh, an incredible substack where he, I believe, not that long ago, fled Russia and has been able to uh, have a very successful go on substack. And we have people who are writing in places that are pretty hostile to independent journalism, but through substack, they're able to make it work, especially because it's easy to block a website, but hard to block email. Yep. Well, last question here before we sign off. Are there any substackers that you would recommend or that you enjoy, um, particularly ones who might be of interest to our listeners who care about issues of free expression? No. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody there. Nobody's writing anything over at Substack on these issues. Where do we start? Um, our, our founders typically, they, they usually do these interviews and they're better at it, but they'll, they'll try not to answer because it's like choosing a favorite child. However, since you gave, since you gave the... Um, I bounded it. You bounded it to Substackers that write a lot about free speech issues. You have mentioned Fifth Column. They're a great podcast. Blocked and Reported is a good one. Um, 
uh, and I listen to them. Matt yeah, Tidy. Jesse's a Jesse's a close friend. He's also extraordinarily tall, which doesn't come through <laughs> in his writing, obviously. I wouldn't have known that. <laughs> no, he's like he's like he could be in the NBA with how tall he is. He's I guy. wouldn't have known that. Um, <laughs> that's it. They have a great podcast. Um, Judd Legum is doing very interesting work where he is actually actively, you know, he comes at issues from the left, but he actively solicits and looks at the other side, uh, which I really admire. Freddie DeBoer is a great one. Barry Weiss is now um, hosting voices from all over on a lot of different topics, and free expression is one of them. And speaking of editor, she has an editor, I know, because we've worked with her. She has a great editor. (laughs) She has a great team. Um, And Ilya Shapiro just started a Substack. Oh, did he really? Yeah, we we helped him out with his situation over at Georgetown. But well, great. Uh, Lulu, I really appreciate you taking the time. I, I know it took us a couple months here, and congratulations again uh, Thank you. on the birth of your child and all the success Substack has. I hope to uh, have you on again sometime in the future. Thank you, Nico. Appreciate the, ch- the chance to talk with you. Yeah, that was Lulu Chang Mazervi. She is vice president of communications for Substack and a board member of the video game juggernaut Activision Blizzard. This podcast is hosted and produced by me, Nico Perino, and edited by my colleague, Aaron Reese. You can learn more about So To Speak by subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, which is linked in the show notes, or going over and finding us on Instagram or Twitter, where the handle is Free Speech Talk. We're on Facebook, too, at So To Speak Podcast. And you can email us feedback at so to speak at thefire.org. We also take reviews, which we encourage because they help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, I thank you all again for listening.